The main menu bar's view menu has the following options. Starting at the very top, we have access to the various browser windows available inside of Unreal Ed, those being generic actor classes, groups, level, referenced assets, primitive stats, dynamic shadow stats, scene manager, and the log. Now, if you click on any one of these, the browser window itself is going to open, and you'll notice you have access to all of the same browsers as tabs within this main window. So you don't really have to think of this as you have to choose the right browser from the list. You can really grab any one of them and then just jump to the specific tab that you need. Now at the very bottom of this little submenu, you also have access to Unreal Kismet. And if you give this a second to open, this will show us all of the various scripted sequences that are available inside our level. And we have a separate video series uh, in place to teach you more about Kismet later on. So let's go ahead and close this, and I will close my browser window. Moving down the view menu, we have some options for the property windows. And to really show this off, I need to open up the actor properties window. So I will select this light, and we'll go to view actor properties, which you can also press the F4 key, or you can double click on the object. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and collapse all the categories to make everything kind of disappear there. Now, if we go back over to the view menu, we have first the option to toggle property item buttons. And to really show this off, let me expand the light component and uh, let me scroll down just a little bit, and you'll see that when I go under View, Property Windows, Toggle Property Item Buttons, suddenly a series of buttons will appear, allowing me to increase or decrease certain values, or perhaps add items to arrays, several different functions. In essence, these buttons are always here, though in general you only see them when the property itself is selected. So if I go under View and turn this back off, but I select the brightness property, that spinner comes back. If I come over to maybe a light function and select that, these buttons come back. So it's a way for you to see those buttons all at once rather than having to select the property. Right, it also helps you at a glance see what things can be set. Like, you wouldn't otherwise necessarily uh, realize that the fall-off exponent was an array. Or which one was it, the, uh, the exclusion volumes? Well, I was yeah. trying to find the one that you had said as an array. Whereas if you bring that option up, then we can see at a glance that, okay, there's exclusion volumes, which is an array. And then we have a lot of numerical values which have their sliders or spinners. That's right. So let's go ahead and switch that back off for the time being. Now you can also choose to show only modified properties. And if I activate this, only those properties that we have edited in some way will appear. So it's very useful to get an idea of, uh, you know, maybe what you've edited. Right, it can also be really helpful if you have a certain actor set up just a certain way and you really like how that actor is working. You would like to duplicate those results for another actor. If you turn this option on, it makes it very easy to see exactly what was changed on the specific actor that makes it work so well. Exactly, very cool. So uh, let's go ahead and close this for now and we'll move on down the uh, view menu. Next we have the actor properties option, which we've already seen will open up the actor properties window. Again, that is also attached to F4 or you can double click on an actor to bring it up. Underneath this, we have the Surface Properties window. Now, you can access this by pressing the F5 key as well, and rather than go off into a uh, large lecture about this, we'll just kind of summarize. This allows us to control the overall properties of a BSP surface and how textures are placed on it, though we're going to get more specific on this window in a separate video. So for now, I'll just go ahead and close it. And once again, you can access that through the F5 key. Moving down the View menu, we have the World Properties. And the world properties allow us access to the uh, various properties that actually control this level itself. So little tiny things that are uh, buried inside the actual level, not necessarily associated with any given actor. So let's go ahead and close that down. Now moving down from here, we have the drag grid. Now the drag grid is something that is so wildly important that we're going to have a separate video discussing its importance and how you can go about using it. But in general, just in, in very uh, generalized terms, I'm going to jump over here to the top viewport and we'll grab any static mesh you like. In fact, let me expand this viewport. I'm going to grab this great big static mesh here, and I will tap my spacebar to get back to the translation widget, and watch as I move this static mesh. You'll notice it's not moving smoothly. It's, in fact, popping by 32 uh, unit increments, and that is because if, or I think it's 32. It might be more than that. Let me come under view and go to uh, the drag grid. Yeah, it is 32. So you can see here that our drag grid is currently set to 32 Unreal units. So as I try to move the object, it jumps 32 units at a time. If I happen to need more precision for placing this mesh, I can go under the drag grid settings and set this down to a lower value, such as 4. You'll notice that my grid becomes much tighter visually and that now I'm only popping between 4 unit increments. So I have a lot more precision in placing uh, my meshes. 
Now, if for some reason you needed to turn the drag grid off, like even if you set this all the way down to one unit and you weren't getting the precision you needed, which can happen, uh, although usually it happens with static meshes uh, and only in rare instances, you do have the option of turning the drag grid off altogether, and then when you're moving your object smoothly with no snapping whatsoever. However, it's a good idea to leave this set as high as you can get away with. All right, moving on from here, we have the rotation grid, and what this does is it allows you to snap any rotations that you might be making to various degree increments. For example, you can see here that it's set to 5 degrees, and if I come back over into the viewport and tap the space bar to bring up the rotation widget, as I try to rotate my object, you'll notice if you look closely that it is snapping to 5 degree increments, which is very handy if you need precise rotation. But you can change this if you want to, to anywhere from 2 degrees through various ranges all the way up to 90 degrees. And if for some reason you don't want that snap to take place, you can switch off Use Rotation Grid altogether. Underneath this, we have the Auto Save Interval. Now, this doesn't allow you to turn off the Auto Save feature. It simply allows you to change how often Auto Save is going to happen. And Auto Save is a very handy feature if you're working in a map or on maybe a very uh, complex map or maybe you're doing other things on your computer and you're concerned about stability. Uh, this will automatically save a copy of your map into a special Auto Save folder inside of your uh, Unreal installation. So you can just set this to whatever you're most comfortable with. Keep in mind on some larger levels that autosave can take several seconds to complete. So if you're in the middle of something uh, very intricate and you don't want to be bothered by it, you might want to set this to a higher value. But if you're really paranoid about losing work, you might want to set it to something lower. If you need to switch autosave off altogether, heaven forbid, you can do so in the lower right-hand corner of the console bar, though you will not be able to see that here on this video because I'm capturing it at a very low resolution, so we don't actually see the option. So moving down the view menu, we have the scale grid. This works very much like the drag grid and the rotation grid in that it allows us to scale to percentage increments. So uh, currently we have this set to 5% increments. We can set it as high as 50% or as low as 1%. Or if we don't want any snapping, we can turn this off altogether. Underneath this, we have viewport configuration, and this allows us to control how our viewports are laid out. To really show this off, let me demaximize my top view here. And by default, you're looking at what is generally referred to as a four view. In Unreal, this is a two by two split. So let's go under view, viewport configuration. You can see two by two split is checked. I can set this to a one by two split where we get one viewport on the left and then two stacked viewports over on the right. We can also alternatively set this to a one by one horizontal or vertical split where we have one, uh, one viewport on the top and one on the bottom or one on the left and one on the right, whatever we'd like to work with. In general, I like to leave this on a two by two split. I'd also like to bring up though that occasionally if you are jumping between a lot of different applications or perhaps if you've been changing the resolution on your monitor, I have occasionally seen instances where the viewports will break. Maybe they'll be completely grayed out or you're just not getting any reaction from them and it seems like they're broken. Before you assume that Unreal Ed has crashed, try coming under your view menu, going under viewport configuration and reinvoking 2x2 split. This will redraw the viewports from scratch and can help you get out of certain difficult instances like that. Right, changing all, changing or going through the different options causes the viewports to reinitialize. So if something has caused the viewports to break, that can sometimes fix it. That's right. So moving down from here, we have detail mode. And this is kind of an interesting tool. It allows you to set different levels of detail at which to view your level. And to really show this off, let me go ahead and maximize the perspective viewport. Now, every single object that we see here, and really the important ones would be our static meshes, have a detail mode setting which allows us to control when we would and would not see that object depending on if we change the detail mode. Now, if that sounds really complex, let me go ahead and just show you how it works. I can select, say, uh, this static mesh right up here. You see this little kind of semi-circular tube-looking thing? If I right-click on this, I have the uh, access to set detail mode, and I can set this to low, medium, or high. By default, I believe all these guys are set to low, so it doesn't matter what we change this to. But if I set this to, say, medium, as an example, I can now come under the view menu, and let's uh, go to our detail mode. Currently, we're set to high detail mode, so we still see the mesh. If I come under medium, we also see the mesh because its detail level is medium. But if we go under low, boom, the mesh disappears because this mesh is only visible at medium detail mode or higher. So you can use this as an organizational system to hide out various detailed, uh, detailed meshes based on uh, what you want to see at any given time. It's not something that I use really all that often. In fact, technically, I don't think I've ever really used it outside of demonstration purposes. 
All right, moving on from here, we have resized top and bottom viewports together. Now, this is super handy because by default, when you drag this little cross beam, you'll notice these guys move independently of one another, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes it can be a real pain. If you don't like that, you can come under view and you can switch on resized top and bottom viewports together. And there you go. Now you'll notice that crossbar is working on the top and at the bottom at the same time. <clears throat> It's really useful for keeping the feel of a more standard four view. That's right. So uh, moving down from here, we have access to brush marker polys. And this shows us any polys that are generally invisible to us on uh, certain brushes, such as volumes. Here I have a volume around this door. And if I select this volume and then turn on brush marker polys, we can now see the polygons that make up that brush, and we can see where they're intersecting with the walls. This can be nice to help you visualize where polygons uh, on such brushes are intersecting with other geometry, but really that's about all it's used for. I don't use it all that much, just to kind of as a check, and as soon as I'm done with it, I'll turn it back off. Also, though, notice that if you deselect that object and turn brush marker polys on, you don't see anything, so it's really only available while that object is selected. Now, down from here, we have Toggle Prefab Lock. Now, to really show this off, we need to kind of do a quick discussion over what prefabs are, and I'll even create one for you. A prefab is really nothing more than a collection of actors which you will treat as a single object. Now, as an example, I'm going to grab this light and this light mesh. So I'm going to hold down Control and make sure both of these objects are selected. I'm going to right-click, and buried somewhere in this menu, here we go, I have Create Prefab. Now, I get a little package group and name, so let's go ahead and put this in a, a new package. I'll call this um, Zach Package, and then group will be Prefabs, and then name will be um, Fluorescent Light. And because I like doing this, we would do uh, Prefab underscore. So we know immediately that this was some sort of a prefab. Click OK. Would you like to replace these actors with an instance of the new prefab? Well, yes, I would. And what this is going to do is kill out this light, kill out this static mesh, and instead replace them both with the prefab that I just created. But we won't really see a change. We will, however, get, if we uh, take a really close look, it's kind of hard to see unless I move this guy away from the wall, which I'll go ahead and do. We have a prefab icon on this, uh, on this actor as well. And what this means is this is no longer just uh, two separate objects. This is actually thought of as a singular group. A, a prefab is like a single group of many different actors. Now, jumping back over to the view menu, we have the uh, option of toggling prefab lock. If this is on and I select any one of the actors in this prefab, it's like selecting the entire prefab itself. I have no individual control over these actors. So if I come back under view and switch this back off, I can now select, say, the light by itself and move it around. I can select the mesh by itself and move it around. But if I need to select everybody at once, I need to grab the prefab actor. Right. It can be very useful if you've already placed many prefabs. And then notice that individual prefabs need to be edited slightly, but you don't want to affect all the other ones. You could uh, toggle the prefab lock and adjust the specific ones that you need to change. That's right. Now I'm going to try to piece everything back together here. So we'll move the light up. We'll move the actual light actor back generally into place, and then we'll go back under view and toggle prefab lock. So now this is all treated as a single actor once again, and we'll stick it back to the wall. Okay, so that's a quick look at toggling prefab lock, which really only leaves one more option, and that is full screen mode, which uh, is... <laughs> I kind of snicker when I see it because really all it does is it gives you about, uh, I don't know, I think it's like a centimeter of extra screen space because it gets rid of the title bar and the, uh, what, the Windows start bar down across the bottom of your interface. It just means that Unreal Ed takes up all of your screen. So if, you, if you're just dying to get that little bit of extra real estate, you can do that. Generally, I leave this off, though. Or if for some reason the machine you're working on has a crazily resized task bar, then, yeah, the, then it then can be, yeah, it'd be very handy for that. So that is uh, all of the options available to us inside the view menu.